My name is Joshua Tucker. I'm a professor in the politics department here at NYU and the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming out and also to say, since there are so many uh, new faces here, where Ala is standing right now is our sign-up sheet. We have an email list where you can get events about information about events at the Jordan Center. Uh, and we have lots of great events going on throughout the entire uh, semester. And so uh, just to highlight a couple coming up on this, uh, this Thursday, uh, so in tomorrow at 5 o'clock over at the Jordan Center on 19 University Place, second floor. We're going to have an event where we're bringing together teams from around the country who've been analyzing the Twitter data that was released by Twitter of the IRA, the IRA trolls that were identified um, the IRA trolls that were identified as trying to uh, be active during the course of the 2016 elections. There are scholarly teams at different universities, including here at NYU, that have been analyzing this data. And we're going to bring together three of those teams to report on what people have learned from these analyses. Later on in the semester, we're going to have a, 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 an event around Stephen Cohen's new book, the, you know, the provocatively titled War with Russia question mark colon or whatever exactly it is at this point. Um, but we've got lots of stuff going on this semester. Lots more things, so if you can, if you're new to the Jordan Center, our normal, our location, we're physically located in 19 University Place. Please do take the time to sign up and leave your email address, and then we, you'll get emails about our events. You can also follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. So anyway, it's, we, we, we have to take advantage when we get uh, such events like today and bring in new faces, so we hope you'll, you'll join us. We have a wonderful blog as well that we send out through the email list of all the rushes that was edited originally by Professor Bornstein in the back here. It's now being edited by Professor Vinacor, but we still feature lots of, uh, of commentary. And what is, it, what is the current series, All the Aliens? Or Russia's Alienation. Russia's Alienation is the current series from Professor Bornstein that we're featuring today. So anyway, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. I'm going to turn it over. I'd like to welcome Ala Royans, who is the uh, Russian and Slavic Studies librarian here at NYU, who is going to introduce our speaker for today. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for showing up. We understand that time is a little bit awkward, maybe. People still work at this time, some oh. of us. So uh, thank you for carving this out of your day. Uh, prior to uh, and working as a, a Russian Slavic Studies librarian in, in NYU, I ran a series of cultural literary events in Brooklyn Public Library, and this is when uh, I met uh, Dmitry Bukov, who was a guest of our literary series three or four times, at the very least, maybe even more. And every time, uh, this program would be on the subject of Russian literature, and it would be in Russian. So today is my first experience of Dmitry Bikov lecturing in English about something not literature related. Uh, but um, I uh, would like to, I'm sure you all know who uh, Dmitry Bikov is and read his books and follow him, uh, his journalistic career. But uh, just to recap, uh, Dmitry Bikov is a poet, is a writer, an award-winning um, writer of fiction and non-fiction uh, books, biographies of um, uh, Russian literature so, uh, figures, Akhujava, uh, Pasternak, Gorky, Maikovsky. Maikovsky, thank you. Um, and uh, he also teaches literature uh, in high school uh, and had taught literature in higher education, education institutions. Uh, he is a columnist for variety of news media outlets and uh, has a huge following in, uh, in Russia and the world. A very narrow variety of Russian free media. Okay. Very narrow variety of Russian free media. Thank you for the correction. So I would like to welcome Dmitry for his lecture on taboo in current Russian political discourse. Dear, dear friends, I'm happy to see all of you. As my ex-compatriot Nabokov said once, I am a great thinker, a good writer, and poor speaker. <laughs> um, I'm maybe a normal thinker, a poor writer, and I can't, um, can't even explain you my method of speaking because I should translate my every phrase from normal Russian into bad English. And I think it's a kind of hypocrisy to speak English here, where at least everybody understands Russian. But still, we have to imitate 
our new identity. So let's speak English and understand each other. By the way, I must say that it's not a public lecture. Generally, it's not a lecture, not a scientific exploration of Russian ideology, because there is no ideology in Russia. I'll explain why. We must say that <coughs> in Russia, I'm a kind of a public intellectual. Uh, the word intelligentsia is untranslatable. It doesn't mean intelligence, as you know. So public intellectual in modern Russia is a person who gives the others reasons for political public bullying, uh, who is just the subject of political anger, but he is quite safe, because there are maybe only five or ten public intellectuals who express their ideas about Putin's regime. They are safe because they are very few and they are the only ones who create the agenda. There is no positive agenda in Putin's regime, and we, the traitors and the enemies, are the only topic of political discussion of all the TV programs. So that means that they should keep us, otherwise they would have nothing to speak about. So Russia has no ideology at all because Russia is not an ideological country. You know, it uh, is ready to discuss any moral qualities, for example, and moral questions like all the Russian literature. You know, we have great literature, but practically no philosophy, or for example, no uh, some social sciences, because all the creators of American social sciences immigrated from Russia, like Kirim Sarokin, and created it here in the USA. Uh, Russia is not ready to express what does she believe in. But Russia has the system of bans, of forbidden topics, of the zones of silence. And those zones are really very vivid, very interesting. Looking at them, we can define somehow what is the positive ideal of Putin. You know, there is a common question, who is Mr. Putin? It was asked in, as I recall, 1999. It still has no answer. By the way, we have many answers, but they are not exact. Uh, he escapes somehow from all definitions. And most of her history, uh, with its history, Russia escapes from any shape. Maybe that's the reason that it's still alive, because only escaping of any ready decisions, any ideas which are formulated, helps us to survive. That's our way of surviving generally. But there are some principal questions which you can't touch at all when you live in Russia. They are most dangerous. And exploring them, you can understand what is really painful, what is really significant for modern Russian politics, and for example, for Russian political leaders. You know those zones of silence were changing regularly. For example, under Stalin, you couldn't discuss the world of Stalin's prisons, the so-called Articula Gulag. And so it was the greatest sensation of the 60s that some texts about this, first in the so-called Samizdat, uh, then officially, were published. And it made Solzhenitsyn's monument, Solzhenitsyn's great fame in Russia and in the outer world. The, uh, I should say that most of Russian people who were surviving this time, so who were just the witnesses of Stalin's terror, they didn't want to know that uh, about one-fifth of population had the prison experience. It was somewhere in the dead zone, like Stephen King calls it, somewhere in the dark zone of their minds. They knew it, but they didn't want to think of it. Then, for example, under Brezhnev, there were some topics which were also forbidden. I must say that Brezhnev's time was maybe the most free, and maybe the most pleasant for life, and maybe most prolific for Russian literature, because there was no such a uh, rigid control uh, over Soviet mind. They were quite free to talk everything they wanted at their famous intelligentsia kitchens. They could discuss everything because they were not dangerous. At the same time, there were some topics, for example, uh, like outer space, like life in America, which were not banned, but they were not acceptable for discussion. There was the dead zone. So all the borders were closed, and uh, maybe all attempts to leave the country uh, were just the kind of also, um, I couldn't say that immigrants were traitors. But they were not understood by majority. 
Uh, Russia lived in the strong conviction that all the other world lies in heaven. More than this, all the outer world is practically, has no spirituality. I can't understand this term and I can't translate it. What is spirituality, nobody knows. But Russians, and the British understand, were the only keepers of any ancient spirituality. And all the outer worlds lived only by material interest. Well, Putin's system is much more rigid and maybe uh, much more cruel than Brezhnev. Brezhnev was sold, he was a kind grandfather of the nation, and nobody was afraid of him, everybody was laughing. Putin is not an object of laughter, not an object of anecdote, you know, the anecdote is maybe the main uh, creation of Russian folklore in the 20th century. We have no anecdotes about Putin because all our life is somehow transformed in the giant anecdote. You know, the foundation of any political satire is hypocrisy. And there is no hypocrisy in Russia now. Everybody understands everything. So that's, uh, this has something in common with a bad play, which is played by bad actors for the seventh or tenth time. Like, for example, Russian history now repeats the seventh circle, the seventh century of the same political play with all its four stages. We have Revolution first, freezing, then, then a kind of thaw, then a kind of swamp, and everything repeats without any changes. Everybody understands everything, so there is no twice moral, there is no moral at all. Uh, but there are some uh, strictly forbidden, some dangerous topics which shouldn't be discussed. They ate, and then they list them in my uh, typical manner of school teacher, because I know that if the school audience doesn't get the straight list of uh, some important points, it will forget your lecture tomorrow. So the first point, and maybe the main foundation, the main notion of Russian political system, is the Great Patriotic War, as we call the Second World War. You know, there is a strange Russian term which is really untranslatable. Uh, translatable. It appeared under Putin in uh, 2008. Uh, I don't know how to translate it. Uh, sure, we know. Clip uh, or somehow the giant clip, I should say. Skrepa uh, is something that unites nation instead of any normal unifications like the moral law or uh, judicial law or constitution or and so on. Uh, they are not demanded in Russia because everybody understands the norm by themselves. We can't define them somehow. So the main clip, the main skrepa of our time is the Great Patriotic War because it was the only time when the so-called civil war, which goes in the society for all the time during all Russian history, was stopped by the outer aggressor. That was the time of needful unification, of such unification which left us no choice. Everybody who lived in Russia at this time had to support the power because there was really no alternative. Uh, Great Patriotic War shouldn't be discussed because that's the subject of religion, like Boris Trubetsky said in one famous Russian writing, in one of his uh, last interviews just before his death, he said, now uh, war is not the object of historical exploration. That's an object of religion. Uh, why so? Because maybe that's the most impressive, most traumatic, most bloody event in Russian history. The victory was bought really by an understandable value. And so there is the only point where there can be no discussion. There can be no different views. We have in front of us such a defiant, such an evident evil that there can be no uh, moral arguments about it. But that's not our personal idea. That's the idea which was formulated, which was published uh, by Thomas Mann in his giant afterword for Dr. Faustus, where he wrote, I must say that in maybe in some attitudes, in some aspects, the Second World War had any moral pluses for the society because the forces of peace 
the forces of humanism could be united at last. We had in front of us such an evil and that clear evil that there could be no moral problems which always uh, make, which always become the subject of quarrel between intellectuals. Now all the intellectuals, all the humanists, all the true writers, all the true fighters for the world, they were unificated by such a figure like Hitler because you couldn't support him anyhow. Like, for example, Churchill said, if Saturn would be against Hitler, I would go on his side. And that was quite normal. So you shouldn't write any explorations, you shouldn't publish any explorations about the Great Patriotic War. First of all, you shouldn't mention the cases of Russian collaborationism. It's forbidden totally. You shouldn't mention the mistakes of Russian leaders who, for example, couldn't cope with the blockade of Leningrad, and the blockade is also undiscussable. There are some myths which were created by the ideologists of the Soviet Union at the beginning of the war, and then they were repeated and repeated. You shouldn't destroy them, because, like, for example, our Minister of Culture, Medinsky, said, when you are destroying the myth, you just destroy the foundation of nation. You destroy the personality of Russian people. They shouldn't explore it. We don't need historical truth. Because, first of all, there is no historical truth. You know that we all live in the period of post-truth. Uh, here in the USA, it has some specific features. But in Russia, post-truth means only that everybody constructs its own image of reality. And nobody can change it uh, by his own will. You shouldn't touch others' ideas and others' myths. You shouldn't destroy the old tales, because the main necessity for humane mind is to believe, not to know. Maybe that's Russian speciality, because you know that, for example, political analysis and search for truth is maybe the main idea of the so-called enlightenment. But I must say that ideas of enlightenment are compromitated in Russia now. Most of Russian philosophers say that enlightenment and ideas, for example, of French philosopher for the 18th century, they were leading to fascism in its final development. Maybe uh, the hope on humane brain, on humane mind, is the hope to live without God. And only God knows the truth. That's the construction of Russian historical myth. You shouldn't explore the history of the Great Patriot War. You should believe to the newspapers. You should create not the truthful but inspiring construction of a Russian great victory. The second topic, which is practically forbidden, is, as for example in Brezhnev's time and the Stalin's time and even in the Tsarist's time, the topic of prison. I should say that the ideology of great prison, of archipelago, like you know, otherwise this notion and this title wouldn't become a kind of proverb in Russia, wouldn't go into the language. Archipelago, like the so-called prison system in Russia, or all Russia penitentiarial system, is practically forbidden to discuss, because that's another clip another scrape. Maybe, like Alexander Shetinsky, a famous Russian science fiction writer, formulated, the only foundation of our ethics is fear. Without fear, sure, Russia begins to feel a political freedom, but not only political, but total existential freedom, which allows to do anything at all. Uh, when you have no moral borders, fear is the only mean to direct the country. And the fear of prison, which is maybe the most horrifying place in the world, is maybe the only clip, the only foundation of Russian national conscience. You know that fear of prison uh, is going through all our old Russian literature, especially Chekhov's. And there are many texts, like for example, notes from the Dead House, or Sakhalin the Island, or the mentioned Kulak, and so on. Many texts which describe the structure of Russian society, which duplicates, which repeats the structure of prison. Sure, it's vertical. Sure, it's full of bands and dead zones. 
I'm sure in such society there are concrete structures, concrete, um, I should say, uh, concrete places for everybody. You can't change it. A Russia is structured, for example, like in any closed society, and especially a prison society. Uh, there are kings of it, uh, there are leaders, there are jokers, there are slaves. And sure, in Russian society, the borders of all those classes are very strong. You can't change them. So it's vertical, uh, and more than this, uh, without the strong borders, without the bands, forbiddings, and so on, it simply can't exist. It would be destroyed by the first uh, warm winds of freedom. Adam Mickiewicz, for example, in 1924 wrote that Russia is the kind of frozen waterfall, and if the first warm wind will come from Europe, all this great structure will just disappear on our eyes. And it happened many times in Russian history. The third problem, which can't be discussed, is the problem of self-governing of regions. I had a sad experience of public speaking when, for example, I was, I just tried to explain how Russia could, maybe, destroy its vertical organization. Self-governing was the favorite idea of Tolstoy and then of Solzhenitsyn. Maybe it was the main idea of Alexander II reforms, because the vertical direction is not acceptable in the modern world, in the world of modernity. Everybody should be responsible for its own political will, for its own fate. But in Russia, maybe, people have some more important business than to be responsible for their fate. They hate politics. What are they busy with? I can't say. Maybe, for example, if you come to a Russian doctor, uh, or for example, for a Russian plumber, you see that he has much more problems than to help you, than to solve your problems somehow. They're busy by something. Maybe they're just thinking the world. Maybe their silent thinking is just keeping the world in its shape. But they don't want to do anything concrete for their own fates. Uh, they don't want to vote because responsibility for your own political faith prevents you to uh, <coughs> praise yourself, to love yourself. Somebody is always guilty and power is always guilty also. Uh, it's praised and loved till the governor is alive. Then after it he would be responsible for everything and there is no doubt that after Putin, Putin will be the main reason of all Russian problems. He knows it. He will be guilty for everything, and nobody is responsible for Crimea, for example, for Chechnya, for Donbass. Nobody is responsible because nobody participated in it. Everybody was just the spectators. Maybe B. D. Bohr in his uh, uh, book about the society of spectacle, the society of performance. Maybe he didn't mention it. Maybe he didn't mean Russia. But Russia is directly the society of performance. Because 10 percent of population are performing everything, and most of the 90 percent are just the spectators, not participants. They are discussing uh, uh, happening there. Maybe that's the reason that social nets are so popular in Russia. That's the heaps of political garbage. All those discussions are practically useless because they have no relation with uh, nowadays practice. The people discuss everything that happens, but never change it. And so every attempt, any attempt of self-governing on uh, the so-called governing on places, any attempt to create any horizontal structure in Russia, uh, they are suppressed directly. And that's the reason that we have practically no political life in provincial cities is dangerous. And provincial leaders are much more dangerous for Putin because in Moscow everybody can be caught, can be seen, and provincial is not as transparent as Moscow political life. So nobody knows what happens there. It's just the dark, the wild space which is not discussed, which is not explored. You know that all the question about questions about 
real political state in, provin in uh, provincial cities is also forbidden. And I must say that most of victims of political suppression and political repressions, they are provincials because they are more dangerous for Moscow. The only political leader which is active in Moscow is Navalny. There are heaps of leaders in province, like in the province like Roisman, for example. But even Roisman uh, was um, maybe the main victim of political labels. It had such a company against him that even his attempt to be mayor of the city stopped him for years. And now he is again quite a lonesome and bull person. The fourth point, which is not to be discussed, is surely army. Uh, the state of the army in Russia, the moral state, first of all, can be discussed and can be explored also. Uh, I served there, and I know that most of the officers were hated by the soldiers, but it's also not a point of discussion. There was a very short period, the end of 80s only, the so-called glasness, where we could discuss the state of army, and more than this, the moral state of those who didn't want to serve. You know, the armed service is the necessary school of obedience. In Russia, we even have such a special proverb, who didn't serve can't be called a man. Uh, some say that those who wasn't in prison, who wasn't in prison, also can call himself a true man. There are two schools of obedience, army and prison. And they are not to be publicly discussed. And which is more important, they are practically closed for any scientific exploration. We don't know what happens there. We don't know the social services and social conditions of officers' life. We don't know their spirits and their ideas. It's not explored at all. We can't imagine uh, the size of, uh, for example, of, I don't know how to translate it, because in English, you don't have such word. But sure, the military matter in uh, military matter in Russia is giant, and we can't imagine even what amounts of money go for the armaments and how they are wasted. That's a closed topic. And more than this, any attempts to explore this topic, they somehow destroy the system of Russian defense. If you try to explore it, if you try to write about it, it means only that you help the enemy. Russia is surrounded by enemies, and that's normal. They all want to steal our spirituality. <laughs> because, because they're always in bias about it. They don't know what is it, but it's not what it, they know that that's our ways for heaven. The fifth point, which is not discussed usually, is the private life of the leaders and mostly the main leader. That's practically closed topic. We don't know why. You know that in the USA, for example, the family life of president is the beloved topic of political and moral speculations. I should say that being a truly Russian, I hate this situation. I am quite sure that any politician has uh, a right for privacy. Uh, such transparency and such political correctness, I think, is really insulting for a real political leader. If I am Russian president, and maybe sometimes I happen to be him, I'll close my public life at all. Maybe because my public life is not as uh, fine as my public lectures. But nevertheless, I must say uh, that in Russia you can't speak on private life of leaders at all. First of all, uh, public life and private life of Vladimir Putin is closed totally, and that's normal. And more than this, most of Russian leaders have some relatives or children who live in the outer space. They live here, they work here, they earn money here, but this information is closed practically. Most of them have the second citizenship, uh, including even the political leaders of Russia. Most of Soviet propagandists who uh, um, express their total hatred for the West have the Western citizenship and some ownership in the West. This information is also <coughs> sensational, and if you, like Navalny, sometimes 
if you public it, that's really dangerous for your life. You shouldn't touch it at all. The sixth topic, which is practically closed, is Russian history and mostly uh, history of uh, Russian political setting, I should, call, I should call it. Political repressions, for example, even now, uh, the numbers of repressed, uh, the system of political suppressing, the system, for example, of, even of Tsarism, uh, you know, three, cent three centuries past, but even some tortures in the times of St. Peter's or Catherine or Nicholas I, who is Putin's favorite of all Russian Tsars. This topic is practically closed. You shouldn't discuss it. Because most of Russian history, maybe, is the space of struggle between two branches, between the so-called Westernians and Patriots. So, Patriots hate any attempts to explore political struggle. Maybe the most dangerous person in all Russian political science is Alexander Yanov, who is exploring the adventures of Russian idea and invention of Russian idea, the idea of Russian special way in the history. That's the reason Alexander Yanov lives mostly in the USC. Uh, it's also explainable that any explorations of Russian political history are directed by specially organized, specially named people who have right for historical, uh, historical explorations. You know that uh, history in Russia was always the business of the state. It was the problem of the state. It was directed by the leader personally. For example, like Karamzin's history or like Pushkin's explorations of Pugachev's uh, rebellion. It was allowed only from uh, the very uh, highest uh, positions of the society, from Tsar and maybe only from the directors of the so-called uh, um, secret police like we can call uh, the famous um, uh, third part. I must say that uh, all historical explorations in Russia are not only directed by government, they are censored by government. For example, any attempts to explore Lenin's activities, to explore military archives, it's still closed. And you know that military archives in Russia are closed till 1940. Then we have the seventh point, which is so dangerous that even now I'm afraid to speak on it. Because I'm quite sure that here are some special spies which would write special reports of my dangerous speeches. That's the problem of Russian nationalism. You should be surprised, because most of you say that Putin is Russian nationalist number one. And sometimes even Putin himself says like, for example, in his famous interview with Nikolai Zlobin, uh, your Washington compatriot and Russian historian, I am Russian nationalist, first of all, because I know that being true nationalist in Russia is just, to care, is just caring about all other nationalists, about internationalism. Sure, he's not nationalist and not internationalist, but I, I, I'm quite sure he has no convictions at all, because uh, try to believe me, in the 90s, he was an honest man. He was believing in all the ideals of his chiefs, and chef, and so on. He has no political convictions. He's just a leader. But he is really afraid, like all the KGB officers, he is totally afraid of all the people with any strong convictions. These strong convictions can be nationalist. And you know that Putin suppresses Russian nationalism because Russian nationalism is dangerous, dangerous for the stable power. Russian nationalists also raise some questions. They try to discuss Russian identity. And any political discussions, any theoretical discussions are dangerous. So you would ask, what can be discussed? The weather, for example, or some abstract subjects like this spirituality, like Russian special way. Nobody can explain what is speciality of Russian way. But everybody is sure that Russia can't repeat anybody's experience. Russian is not East, not West, not South, and even not North. Uh, you know that there are some nationals who believe in our Nordical character and so on. 
So it is not discussed at all because any theory, any ideology can be the reason for civil war. And maybe there's a reason that now in Russia we have practically no science. We have a very small ghetto, which is also good now and may will be closed very soon, the so-called high school of economics. That's a so-called, maybe, it's a, uh, if to compare, for example, with the times of uh, the Second World War, it's a kind of ghetto where uh, Jews can govern by themselves, and after it, they surely will be destroyed. But now they have a short period of allowed being, allowed work. So you know that any political discussions are possible only when they are directed by something. And the F point, which is totally forbidden, which is not to be discussed, is Russian future. There is no structures, no ideas, no political reforms which could be planned now. Maybe that's the most terrifying zone of silence, because you know that Russian tomorrow is unexpected and unexplainable even for Russian leaders who should plan it. You know, every normal leader, even in the USA, should I say being loyal, even more than leader of the USA, has some special plans. And sometimes they are discussed in the society. More than this, uh, he must have some program to express it and to present it. In Russia, the only guarantee of future is not to mention it. I should say that maybe it's kind of national character, because any talks about future are forbidden even in Russian proverbs. Like, for example, Zagat Bagat you shouldn't think about the future. If you want to make God laugh, tell him about, his, about your plans, and so on. Future is a forbidden topic not only in Russian politics, but in Russian culture also. Uh, only science fiction was the space where some dreamers could make social projects. In general, in Russia, discussing of future is a bad manner, is something unacceptable in society. Like, for example, uh, talks about mm, somebody's appearance or uh, about somebody's incomes. You shouldn't discuss it because otherwise you can destroy it. That's the topic which is always in the fog of dreams. And maybe any concrete ideas about the future, they are now suppressed most radically. For example, the question who is Putin is not dangerous now. Everybody knows that this question has no answer. But what is after Putin? That's the question which can be discussed only in social nets. Maybe because for Putin there will be no time after Putin. He can't imagine it. Maybe there's the reason that most of Russian leaders, uh, maybe except Khrushchev, who is just the bright example of loser, they never changed their position and died on throne. Maybe politically uh, safe and politically correct leaving of the throne of the highest position would be the guarantee of Russian future, but it never happened in Russia. You shouldn't discuss the future because otherwise you can call, you can organize the new rebellions and uh, the new problems. Uh, maybe the only point of the future is keeping all the safety, keeping all the stable state. Uh, by the way, Russia always was really stable, I think, sometimes. Maybe in the system of world, if to look at it like at a political organism generally, Russia is the kind of back, just the kind of stable and safe system which never moves. You know that you should have hands, for example, like China, which is always very active and always constructing something. Maybe you have brains, which uh, just now are divided between, for example, um, radical East and Old West. Maybe you should, you should have some genital story which are situated somewhere in Latin America, which is so uh, maybe so, Reading Marcus, we can see that all the sexual problems are actually only for this part of the world. But Russia is a kind of maybe a kind of main bone in this organism. It never moves. 
and maybe ideas about the exchangers are horrifying not only for Russians. Maybe all the world would like to have such a dead end for everything. And sure, it's not very comfortable for Russians, but it's very comfortable for our world. Because if you have some stable dead end for all political ideas, such a giant swamp where communism disappears and fascism disappears also, and all the military leaders die there, maybe such swamp is necessary, and it shouldn't think about the future. Maybe you can dry this swamp, but it will kill the beautiful floor and wonderful fauna which lives there. It will destroy the brilliant world. You know that in the swamp everything is kept undisturbed. For example, the dead body can be kept in the swamp practically without any uh, signs of dissolence. It will be kept like alive. And maybe in the swamp sometimes you can find uh, the remains of ancient people, the remains of ancient bodies, and maybe the swamp has great historical value. It's not very pleasant to live there. But it is practically impossible to change this fear of life. That's the reason I still don't go away from Russia. Maybe sometimes it's rather uncomfortable to live there, but I'm the product of this fear, and I can't live anywhere else. That's my short report, and maybe after it you'll have some questions. All right. In Russia, we say хорошо, что мало. There must be questions in the auditorium. I have some, but I would let the auditorium auditorium ask first. Yes, please. Yeah. So you listed eight topics which are taboo and are impossible to discuss. Zones of silence, yeah. Uh, would that be fair to say that they cover all serious questions? Can you give an example of some serious question which is allowed to discuss? The first serious question which is allowed to discuss is the Ukrainian problem. Ukraine is the main topic of Russian political shows. This country survives the horrifying decline, and some say that even fascism. Ukraine, which is maybe the negative, the liberal model of Russia, is the main point of discussion in Russia. Well, then the decline of West, sure. You know that America survives very bad times. You know it by your own experience. I say it ironically, but you take it seriously. Uh, so America maybe has greatest problems now, and the discussion of those problems is also very important for all Russian political leaders. By the way, the leader of all Russian outer propaganda, Margarit Simonyan, after Trump's victory, was driving her car from Moscow with American flag in the window, American banner. Uh, that was the celebration of triumph of people's will, because if they can't elect in Russia, there should be a place where people's will should triumph. That's normal for us also. We can discuss some more problems, more, more than this, we can discuss movies, and maybe uh, Russian cinematography, not only Russian, but uh, cinematography in general is the main point of discussion. And now all Russian society discuss is the movie called Dao, made by Ilya Zhanovny. That was a giant program, a giant project, which was uh, maybe a, which was filmed for 15 years, about 700 hours of uh, very uh, complicated and very ununderstandable uh, movement in the uh, specially built decoration in Kharkov. Nobody saw it, I did. Nobody saw it in Russia, but they discussed it passionately. Is it normal to waste 25 million dollars for such a movie which demonstrates tortures and moral violence and more than this? So there are heaps of topics of discussions. Uh, abortions, for example, that's also very actual for Russia. Or, for example, the so-called gay marriage. You know that maybe most of uh, Russians Putin's fans are quite sure that Europe now is lying in sodomical sin, is suffering from sodomical sin. That refugees, you know, that most of refugees in all Europe are destroying it, and Russia, uh, Russia maybe is the only country which keeps its identity because there are no guests from East. There are some, but they are 
uh, just Russian seasonable workers and so on. Uh, decline of Europe, decline of morals, decline of marriage, those topics are discussed. And maybe the, the, this is positive moment. There was never such a huge interest for outer world and such hatred for it, like now. That's the only topic for any discussion at any kitchen. Usually, in the kitchens, people were discussing their problems, work, payments, taxes, and so on. Now, they discuss only the decline of the outer world. And being here in America, I must say that they're right. <laughs> Everything goes worse. Maybe we are the happiest. We live in the safe world. Yeah, please. Yeah. Nothing changes here. Yeah? Uh, a bunch of years ago in Moscow, I begged you to uh, do the lectures about Harry Potter, and you did. Um, are you planning to give any Harry Potter lectures here? And the second <laughs> question, are you already, are you already watched the Kisilov Vdud? Is it worth well, watching? Well, yeah, I never watch Vdud uh, because I don't want to torture myself. I'm not a masochist. <laughs> It's quite enough for me to see Kisilov's programs on official TV, and I must say I have no time to watch it. Being here in America, I, maybe I prefer to watch American TV, uh, which discusses real problems without all those screams and uh, hysterical squeezes and so on, and all those shaking people just with the foam on their teeth and so on. Uh, what about Harry Potter? I have three lectures from Harry Potter in California in childish audience, uh, partly Russian, partly English. And if you are really interested in it, I can repeat it here. I think that uh, any scientific institute is a good place to lecture about Harry Potter. Because, by the way, I may say a really serious thing, you know, that June K. Rowling stopped writing about Harry Potter uh, about seven years ago, and then she went back to this topic. Uh, now she is discussing the problem of green divide. Uh, if you compare Voldemort, uh, like we call him in Russia, Voldemort, if you call Voldemort and compare him with green divide, you will see some principal differences. Green divide, which is a portrait of Hitler, somehow a portrait of European fascism, which is really connected with the cultural history of old Europe, he has some conditions. And now we are opposing, we are opposing the evil, which has no principles at all. I don't know what is it. Maybe it is some Eastern radicalism, maybe it's some terrorism, maybe it's some obscurance, uh, you know, the, the inventions. Of obscurance is the main topic of recent movie. But now we have the new evil, which have no principles and no words, uh, no reason that, no explanation of its origin. Green Divide had some ideas, and Voldemort is just enjoying the evil. That's the reason that Harry Potter is maybe the most important prophecy about. Uh, world's history in recent years. Surely she couldn't guess it, but she tried, she managed to write the new Bible. The Bible which describes the new level of mankind. By the way, the typical question which I always ask to the child, the children, and most of the answer, because uh, modern children are much cleverer than we are, uh, than I am practically. Uh, what is the main difference between Christ's story and the story of her? There are very many similarities. For example, the prophecy, uh, then uh, the mass killing of children, uh, then some problems with father, then a typical traitor, then a typical uh, apostle like Ron and Kermion and so on. Uh, many similarities. All the main ideas of Bible are repeated in Harry Potter. But there is one principle difference. What is it? Children know that there is no Voldemort uh, in Christ's history. It is mentioned, but it doesn't act. So the main change which happened for those 2,000 years, the world evil appeared alive. It constructed itself. 
it somehow gathered itself from the part, uh, from the parts. And now we see it uh, evidently. It appeared. Saturn never appears in Christ's story, but now in Russia, in America, and everywhere, we can see the face of total evil. It appeared. We opposite it, and we should be. It is one already in the magic world in 1994. But we know that uh, our world, the world of so-called metals, is more slow. We should remove this obstacle. Maybe now. More questions from the audience? Yes, please. Who do you think should be questions which should not be discussed? Like, say, in Germany, there is a law which forbids a question. Discussion about all of course, you know? Uh, it's not forbidden. You can explore it. You just can. You just cannot. Yeah, yeah. You you can question it. You can explore it, but you shouldn't say that it never happened. That's the only difference. Uh, there are no forbidden topics in modern European science. You know, the dictatorship of political correctness is broadly discussed in Russia, and I must say that it is uh, exaggerated. It is quite normal in Europe or in the USA to discuss something. I must say that maybe the main plus of Trump's presidency is that some of those dead zones were destroyed. They were destroyed. Now you can discuss practically everything. And now maybe Trump is the mirror which is put in front of America. You can discuss it. You can see yourself. In Russia, Putin is the black curtain which is just hanging in front of Russia. A uh, dark fog which is covering Russia. There would be many interesting things, many interesting explorations when this epoch will finish. Like, for example, Russian politologist George Sakharov said, maybe we will have 10 years only to look for the truth, because it is very well hidden. Ten years will go only to open archives and only to open those dead zones. That would be a good time for journalists. I am advised about future journalists and sorrowful about modern ones, which have to work with their closed mouths you have and tight hands. Please. Uh, what about the topic of Russian patriotism? Also one Russian nationalism is forbidden, sure, but Russian patriotism is allowed. You know, what is patriot? I never could get an explanation. Why should you love your country? This topic is also <laughs> closed because you should uh, love it only because it's your imminent sign, your imminent place of birth. How can you be proud of your place of birth? You never left it. But in Russia, only even in science, like gender, for example, or age, or nation, or your belongingness to a political nation of Russia, and so on, only they can be the subject of pride. Only immanency. I think that immanency is maybe lies in the foundation of all evil. Uh, uh, you should respect yourself only for the result of your personal, your private activities, only for those things which are created by your own hands. In Russia, only such things are respected which were not elected. By Putin, for example, who is also given. Yeah? Yes, I have a question about the election. We all know that in Russia they don't exist, but now we had election in 2016 when Hillary Clinton and uh, comrade Obama would try to uh, steal a lecture from Donald Trump. And uh, they cooked up a story about Russian interference, and uh, we heard uh, from the director of the center that they investigated. I don't know how you can investigate the mythology, but I guess you can. Uh, in the, and uh, you said about not you know, screaming on the TV. You should have seen CNN. It's like fake news network, like 24 7 Sure. So the uh, question I have is, uh, how, uh, how can you uh, contrast elections that you had in Russia when basically Putin and who counted the votes and what we had in the United States when administrative resource was used when you spice into the campaign of Donald Trump and many, many other dirty tricks in order to steal election from right for Well, first of all, I must say that in America there were different parts of society who were using their so-called administrative resources. 
that was not a struggle with the predicted results. You couldn't predict Amsterdam. Everybody had their own right to speculate, and everybody had their own right to influence the elections. It was unpredictable. In Russia, that's a struggle between a practically tight opposition with closed mouth and the giant army of Putinists. They have all rights, and you have no. So that's the difference, sure. Maybe in America, that was a, um, it was a nasty and dirty struggle. And in Russia, it was just beating of weak and helpless children. That's the difference. Uh, there is difference between struggle and torture. Torture is maybe more pleasant than more effective and more interesting. That's the reason that all Russia is torturing the prisoners and torturing each other, and even in families who have very sophisticated tortures. Uh, all Russian life is full of torturing. Uh, but the struggle, as for me, is more pleasant and more resentful and more humane. Well, thank you for attention. If you have some more questions, we can discuss them. Up. Oh, there are a couple of more questions. We don't. Oh, sure. Okay. We, have, we still have some time. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, you pay your the, the Jewish question is relevant in today's Russia. What the Jew Jewish question? Jewish question in Russia is as dangerous as Russian one. You know, because Jewish question is the form of Russian question. For example, Solzhenitsyn famous work two hundred years together. Uh, it's also describing not Jewish problem, but Russian problem. Uh, Solzhenitsyn mentions especially Russian um, uh, friability and Jewish solidarity. Uh, he asks straight, strictly, why all Jews help to each other and all the Russians hate each other, even for example when they meet each other somewhere abroad. All the nations are happy to see compatriots in another country. Only the Russians feel a kind of fear seeing Russians. And even here in this audience, I'm afraid that there are some Russians. <laughs> oh, we all are Americans. Because, you know, Russians some <laughs> Russia, uh, Russian say we Russian is afraid of himself. And sometimes, like the famous Groundhog in America, he is afraid of his own shame. Uh, that's the reason the Jewish question in Russia is just the mirror of Russian question. Why there is no national solidarity and national horizontal connections in any Russian society? Why Jews help each other and Russian people? That's maybe the true essence of Jewish question. Jewish question is not as discussed in Russia now. It's a Caucasian question, for example, because there are very few Jews. That's the reason I still want to live there, because I become really a rear element. <laughs> a rear and expensive. You know, uh, do you take, this uh, famous Russian anecdote of 70s, do you take Jews at the job? Yeah, sure. Where do you take them? Uh, where to take Jews? Uh, maybe we feel now some deficit of Jews, because you know that Jews in Russia are always guilty in everything. So who is guilty now? Uh, it's dangerous to think that Russians can be reason of their problems. But Jews practically disappeared. Uh, now they make their harm abroad, from here. <laughs> they influence from here. There was somebody else here, please. Uh, there are some news recently about uh, Russians taking over Belarus. And uh, do you believe that it might happen so they can you know, raise their popularity after they did it in Crimea? Do you think that it's a possibility? Well, I have been to Belarus just a month ago. And we saw a very radical reaction of Belarus society of this possible project of creation of the new United States and so forth. United States of Belarus. I must say that uh, there was always friendship even between Russia and Ukraine. I remember it very well. I lived in Kiev for, for months. Uh, and even uh, there practically was no border between Russia and Belarus. But now they managed to make enemies out of them. And there is a project very reasonable and very convincing that maybe uh, if Putin wants really to continue his tsarism, his tsarship for uh, next 12 years, he will change the subject of his governing. 
he will create the new United States. Maybe he will manage to do it. But in Belarus, there is very strong opposition against it. And more than this, you know, he managed to create such a situation where Alexander Lukashenko is adopted by society like a typical European leader. He who was named the last dictator of Europe, he who was just the shame of Europe, now he's one of its symbols. And that's very fine that also um, supports Mann's opinion that when you see the true view, <coughs> all your problems are taken away. All the differences are destroyed. Thank you so much for patience.